Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. It's your girl Lungu back with another reaction video. If you're new to this channel, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. A big shout out to everyone that has subscribed to our channel, and a big shout out to the person that suggested this. So today, I'm going to be reacting to how I came to Islam, so without wasting time. This video is going to be in two parts. Let's get into the video. We begin by praising Allah. We praise Him, we seek His help, and we ask for His forgiveness. And we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad وسلم, is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. Now, let me introduce myself, my background. Um, I was born in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam. My father at the time was a colonial administrator in the now uh, defunct British Empire. Um, an empire that stretched once upon a time, wasn't that long ago, uh, over one third of the Earth's surface. Now the only thing left is uh, some islands in the Falklands. That's all that's left of it. How things change. How the mighty have fallen. This is a lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to in the Quran. To travel the earth and see the consequence. See what happened to people who came before you. Who were mightier in power and strength and see what is left of them. So anyway, my father, a colonial administrator, that's where I was born in Tanzania, and they named me Anthony Vatswaf Gavin Green. Okay, I thought you were going to laugh. Vatswaf, Vatswaf is a Polish name, because my mother, in fact, is Polish. And being Polish, she is um, a Roman Catholic. And she always intended that me and my brother, Duncan, Duncan Charles Alexander Green would be raised up good Catholics and so uh, almost from the day that we were born we were enrolled in what is a very famous Roman Catholic boarding school in fact it's a monastic boarding school that means it's also a monastery a place where monks live and teach and this place is called this school is called Ampleforth College it's in Yorkshire, which is in the north of England. So, um, when I was two years old, we left uh, Dar es Salaam. Uh, my brother was born in London. And uh, when we were, well, when he was like eight and I was like ten, we were sent off to boarding school. So from the age of ten, I was sent to uh, this, the preparatory school of Ampleforth College. Now, before... Before my mum, before they sent us off to Ampleforth College, I think my mum decided it was about time that she uh, taught me um, some of the prayers of the Catholics and some of the things that they say. She better prepare me a little bit for this uh, life in the monastery. And although she had married my father, who was an agnostic, which was not really allowed, she was only supposed to marry a Catholic, but she went ahead and married my dad anyway, and uh, she always considered herself as a sort of, not a very good Catholic, but she was going to make up for it by sending me and my brother to the school. And I remember one night she taught me a prayer, a prayer that is used by Catholics quite often. It's one of the frequently used prayers when, when they have a rosary, which is a string of beads on which they count a series of prayers. The main prayer that is said is called the Hail Mary. It goes like this, it begins like this. Hail Mary, Mother of God, blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Now, it was the first bit that when I was a nine-year-old child, hearing my mother say, Hail Mary, Mother of God. I said to myself, how can God have a mother? God is supposed to be without beginning and without end. How could God have a mummy? And so I sat there thinking about this mother of God 
And I decided to myself that, well, if Mary was the mother of God, she must actually be a bigger God than God. Those were the first questions that arose in my mind. And as I went to school, and as I began to think more and study more and research more, I in fact had more and more questions. We used to have to go to confession. Now confession, um, I, I think as far as I remember, we had to do it a minimum of, I think it was once a year, it might have been more than that, uh, but at, you know, at least there was a certain amount of times, a minimum you had to do it. And the priest used to say, you have to confess all your sins. If you didn't confess all of them, then confession is no good and none of your sins will be forgiven. Now believe me, can you imagine? A school of boys aged what? 11, 10, all the way up to 19, 20? You think we're going to be confessing all our sins? And moreover, confessing our sins to the very people who are our housemasters. In other words, they're in charge of us. Now I soon figured that this must be some huge spy conspiracy in order to keep control of people by going and confessing your sins. And I just and I and then I used to ask them why. Please tell me why do I have to go to you to confess my sins to you? Why can't I just ask God to forgive me? I mean, after all, after all, according to Jesus, according to the Bible, we would say the, the actual scriptures. Jesus is supposed to have said, the only prayer that you need is our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Right? That is the prayer. As for the other bit, they add sometimes in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and the power and the glory. That's not there. They added that. If you actually look in the Gospel, that's the Our Father. Now, in the Our Father, you are asking God to forgive you your trespasses, your sins. So, how come I have to come and ask some priest? And you know what they said? They said to me, well, you can ask God if you want to, but you can't be sure that God's going to listen to you. <laughs> right? So, I had a real problem. You know, I had a real problem with this. And I had real problems with the doctrines of the church. I think one of the things that I also had a problem with, a very, very big problem, is the doctrine of incarnation. The idea that God became a man. Now, just to mention something about this. When I was... <coughs> excuse me. When I was... Uh, how old? 11 years old. My dad... Uh, took a job in Egypt. He became the uh, general manager of Cairo Barclays. He opened up Barclays Bank in Cairo. And that's for the next 10 years of my life. That's where I spent my holidays. So I'd be going to school in England and to Egypt for my holidays. Now, you see, Western society indoctrinates us with an equation. The equation tells us wealth equals happiness. Wealth equals happiness. If you want to be happy, if you want to enjoy your life, you need money. Because when you have money, you can buy our nice cars and have our nice TV sets and watch those movies and go on holiday and buy all these things that you so desperately need to fill your lives with, to make your lives happy. This is, what the pro this is what they're telling us the whole time. Yet, in reality, that's not the case at all. And you see, my eyes were being opened up to this. And I began to ask myself as I went back to school, and I have to say I really did not like school at all. I particularly didn't like boarding school. I just couldn't understand why I was in this monastery on the edge of the Yorkshire Moors, miles and miles away from anything and anybody. And here I was in this place. Why? 
What was it all for? I began to ask myself. You know, I used to love my life in Egypt, and I come back to England, and I, I just, why? Why, I would ask myself. And then this is where I began to ask this question. What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? For what reason do we exist? What do all these things mean? What does it mean, love? What is life for? What is it all about? And I figured it. I sat down and I figured it and I said, yep, I am here at school in order to work hard so that I will get good results in my exams. So I can go to a good university, so I can get a good degree, so I can get a good job that will make me enough money so that when I get married and have kids, I can send them back to that same expensive public school, private school, and that they can work hard and get a good degree so that they can get a good job so that when they have kids they can earn enough money to send their kids back to that school right and 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 then I thought about it. I thought that's it that's the purpose of life that's what it's all for I said no way I can't believe that's all there is to life and so I began a quest it was not like today I am going on a quest for the truth it wasn't like that it was just I began to think, I began to search, I began to look through other religions. You know, anything that I thought might give me an insight and an understanding to what is the purpose of life, what is it all about. Now, when I was about 19, something happened very, very, something very important happened, and that was in the 10 years that I spent and my holidays in Egypt only one person ever really had a decent conversation with me about Islam now I had many many questions about Catholicism but when it came to anyone challenging me okay or questioning me I would vigorously defend I would become a defender of the faith <laughs> you know even though I didn't actually believe in it but, you know, I suddenly became a defender of it. It was a strange paradox, okay? I had many questions in my mind, but, you know, especially when it's this Egyptian. I mean, after all, what does he know? <laughs> I'm English. We used to rule these chaps not a few years ago. You know, after this conversation has been going on for about 40 minutes, he's, he asks me a few simple questions, and they've stuck in my head until this day. He said, so you believe that Jesus is God? I said, yes. And he said, and you believe Jesus died on the cross? I said, yes. He said, so you believe God died? And when he said that, you know what? It was, if Mike Tyson had come and smacked me in the face with a fist, right? It wouldn't have had, I mean, I was absolutely flabbergasted. Because I suddenly realized the irrationality and the, 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 the just, I have to say it, the foolishness of, that, of what I was believing. And I was inside myself, of, I said, of course I don't believe that God died. You can't kill God. And I realized that all these years I had been taught something. I had been indoctrinated with something. I had been taught this thing and I always felt uncomfortable with it but you know it just took someone to spell it out for me in clear simple terms look if you believe this and you believe this then you must believe that and I realized that no I didn't believe that but you know what I wasn't going to admit that to him I wasn't going to admit I said <laughs> That's been very interesting, and I, I've got to go up to my cabin now, okay? <laughs> Bye! <laughs> you know, I didn't want to think about it, and I went up and started smoking and having a... I really, really enjoy these stories that people tell of how they found um, um, peace or how they found Islam, and it's very, very interesting. And people usually have so many funny stories. The question was to linger, and people still find themselves asking, how can God die if you believe god can't die then there is more to life than you've known up to this point let me get to the second part of this
about you. 